Turn your Bibles to the book of John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Jesus had been crucified and everything that uh, he had here on earth uh, well, was virtually given to him or loaned to him. He came up in very poor circumstances in the little city of Nazareth and uh, the question was asked on one occasion, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And even though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he lived for many years in the city of Nazareth and then later on he lived a good while around Capernaum and uh, of course his last days were spent in the city of Jerusalem but following his crucifixion uh, he did not have a place of burial of his own and so a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea donated his newly dug grave for Jesus to be buried in. And of course the graves in Israel, especially around Jerusalem, are quite unique in comparison with the graves here. Most of the graves in this part of the country, uh, that uh, you go about six feet uh, under the ground and uh, you place the body uh, six feet under the ground. But there they were dug in the sides of hills and mountains and had to be hewn out of the rocks. And such was the case with the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So let's read about that beginning in verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Now there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and you remember in the third chapter of the book of John that uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus and began to say, uh, we know that our teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except God be with him, and Jesus and emphasized to him the importance of being born again. And so he was still around, and he still maybe was secretly following Jesus and even though he was a man who was of great influence in the city of Jerusalem apparently he had a seat on the Sanhedrin court and was well versed in Old Testament scripture but at the same time he did not know Jesus as his savior and that's why Jesus uh, told him that he must be born again then took the body of Jesus verse 40 and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Now remember Jesus died around 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon. And the Jewish Sabbath began at 6 p.m. on Friday afternoon, and so they had to hurry to make preliminary preparation for the burial. And they were to come back upon the first day of the week and complete those preparations because it was a rather lengthy process, as I understand it, that took some bit of time to bring about. And so that uh, they just had to lay him in the tomb and leave him there until the first day of the week. But I'd like for us to think about the preparation in verse 42. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. And Friday was a day of preparation for the seventh day. And as we think about the day of preparation, we understand that God gives us time to prepare for eternity. And I'm thankful that he does. I'm thankful that he has given us in his word all that we need to know to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And you'd be surprised how many people in the world today have no idea what it means to be saved. That this is something foreign to them. This is something that they have never encountered. And you ask the average person today, are you saved? And they don't know what you're talking about. And you ask, many times I ask people, well, do you know the Lord? Uh, well, yeah, I've known him all my life. Uh, are you prepared to go to heaven? If anybody's prepared to go, I, I, I'm, I'm prepared to go. And, and list many reasons why they feel they're prepared to go, except list every reason except the correct reason as to why they're prepared to go. There's only one correct reason is that we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart and our sins have been forgiven. We've been forgiven of that sin of unbelief and we're ready to go uh, to be with the Lord. And so this being the day of preparation, that many things were needful uh, to be done on that day. And sinner, this might be the day of preparation for you. We have no idea when we're going into eternity, but we know that eternity begins when we leave this body for that individual. So... Israel prepared for the Passover in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. If you go back and read it, you'll see that the Passover was instituted during the time that Israel was down uh, in Egyptian bondage. And so that great preparation had to be made for that day. And I don't, for time's sake, I don't have time to go back and uh, review all of those things that uh, had to be done in order for uh, the Jews to institute the Passover supper. But it was a very special time for them, and it was to be a special time for them, and they were to keep it as an ordinance forever. And the Orthodox Jews still keep Passover today. We as Christians don't keep the Passover, but we observe uh, the Lord's supper until he comes. And so... And I don't have really time to get into a lot of that this morning, but to say that Jesus is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And that Lamb that was offered at the Passover was a substitute for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why a new Lamb had to be used every year at Passover. The same one could not be used over and over. First of all, it had been eaten, the main part of it. And then what was left, it was burned with fire. And, and so uh, that a new lamb had to be sacrificed every year. But Jesus became, as I said a moment ago, that lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. He became that one sacrifice that is sufficient to save all souls. The lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. Now, the male lamb of the first year was the first qualification of that lamb to be sacrificed for the Passover. And they were to eat it with their loins girded. They would have their shoes on their feet and they would have their staff in their hand. In other words, that they were uh, to eat it ready to go. Are you ready to go when the Lord calls you? Are you prepared spiritually to meet the Lord? Well, they were to eat it in haste. Why? He said, is it the Lord's Passover? It's not man's Passover, but the Lord's Passover. And the Lord told them uh, to take uh, the blood of that lamb uh, and to uh, spread it on uh, the door lintel and the doorpost. And when he passed over that night, I've heard a lot of people say the death angel passed over that night, but uh, the Lord himself passed over that night. And he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, not when my angel sees the blood, but when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So it was very important that they follow the instructions that the Lord had given them. The next morning, there was much mourning down in Egypt. He said, my soul, the firstborn, 
And every family who had not applied the blood was taken. You say, was Pharaoh's child taken? Yes. He didn't apply the blood. God is no respecter of persons. He's not going to say, why, uh, you're the president, son, I'm going to make an exception. You're the queen's daughter, I'm going to make an exception. No, it applies to everyone. You need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Israel was warned to prepare to meet God. Read the fourth chapter of the book of Amos. And they were warned to prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Why? Because of their sins and their idolatry. Now it's rather beyond almost understanding why oftentimes that God's people, when they associate uh, with the heathen of, of this world, that the ways of the heathen rub off on the children of God. A little child who starts to school who has been taught good manners and good language. Get in with some little children that have not been taught in that way. You know what's going to happen? Good children's going to let the bad manners from the other children rub off on them. I remember one day I, I was sitting in the home of a lady who was a member of one of our churches and uh, <clears throat> her little daughter came in and she said something that most of us would consider as vulgar. She's just a little fella and her mother was standing at the stove stirring something and she almost dropped it off the stove. It upset her so bad. She walked over there and she said, where did you hear that? She said, down at so-and-so's house. Well, she just gave her a little lecture right there. She, she got off without a whipping probably because the preacher was sitting there. But uh, nevertheless, she was warned if she ever said that again that her mouth would be washed out with soap and she would get a whipping. And explain to her that that was not the kind of language that would be used in that household. That it was dirty, filthy language. And so, the ways of the world can wear off on us. It did many times on Israel. So many times Israel was given to idolatry because of idolatrous, ungodly nations that they associated with. Lord said, come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There are many unclean things in the world today. God places a sense of urgency in the animal kingdom. Should we not also sense the urgency to come to Christ? You know, the little ants prepare their meat in the summer, Solomon said. The little birds build their nest and lay their eggs and have their families during the warm months of the year. Many of the wild creatures go into hibernation during the cold winter months. But they make preparation before they go into hibernation. I would not want to meet a bear while he was preparing for hibernation. He might make me part of the storage in his body of food. But this is what God has programmed into the animal kingdom. And it's just natural for them to do so. But, and the animals for the most part follow 
the plan and program that God has for them. But we humans, we want to do our own thing, don't we? And that was so from the very beginning. Adam and Eve wanted to do their own thing instead of obeying God and not taking of that forbidden fruit. They partook of it. And sin was introduced into the world. And we know that death came as a result of sin. So if you're here and you're lost, should you not sense the urgency uh, to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? What happens when your hunger alarm sounds? You sense the urgency to find food. When you get real sleepy at night, you sense the urgency to find your bed and bed down for the night. When you get real hot, and here in LA, Lower Alabama, it gets real hot in the summertime. Not only the temperature, but the humidity rises up to meet the temperature. <laughs> and when it does that, it's hot. And so we seek a place that's cooler. We seek a shade. We seek the indoors. We seek air conditioning. I heard someone make a statement here a while back. He said, you know what's wrong with us here in the south? That air conditioning has spoiled all of us. But you know, I, I remember as a boy not having an air conditioner, and my dad made a, a, a homemade window fan and put it in the window. And man, I thought that was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. Uh, it, it'd pull air through that window at night, and I'd put my head down uh, down by the uh, at the foot of the bed. Uh, where that air would come through that window? No, I could just drift on off to sleep with that cool air from the outside coming in on me. And man, when we got an air conditioner, I thought I'd just about die and go to heaven. But we sometimes don't sense the urgency that we need to sense. They say, well, I'll do it later. We're great procrastinators. <laughs> what is your philosophy of life? You say, what do you mean? Is your philosophy never do today what you can put off till tomorrow? Or is it never put off till tomorrow what you can do today? Or somewhere in between those two. When it comes to salvation, it doesn't need to be I'll put it off till tomorrow. You say, why? The well, scripture says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Don't delay. Don't put it off. In Proverbs, the 30th chapter, I want to read just a few verses of scripture. And I want you to listen carefully what he said here. Proverbs chapter... 30. And let's begin reading in verse 24. There be four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The answer of people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. A cony is an animal that's similar, well, it looks like a cross between a, a chinchilla and a rabbit. It lives in the rocks, and it can't get overheated. It must stay cool, keep its body temperature down. And it has no natural protection except to run to the rocks and hide when a predator begins to get after it. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. Remember when the locusts came and stripped the crops 
Did you read about it in the scripture? The spider taketh hold with her hands as in king's palaces. I've heard ladies say, you know, this is a brand new house. The spider's already been in webs in it. Looks like a new house. There wouldn't be spiders in it. The Bible said a palace has spiders in it. I remember when President John Kennedy was elected president. His wife Jackie said she didn't want to live in that, in that White House. Said it was rat infested. Well, that's the official residence of the President of the United States. Whether she want to live there or not, she had no choice. Kind of like being in prison when you get elected president. You're told when to go and when not to go and where to go and where not to go. You're not free to do your own thing. God made spiders for a purpose. So, these little creatures make preparation for the future. They don't have to be told to do it. They just do it. Instinctively, they do it. Sinner, what about you? You need to be prepared for death whenever it comes. Death is inevitable. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 12, we're told that man knoweth not his time. That is, his time of leaving. And he said, the sons of men are snared at an evil time. And he went on to talk about the fish being snared on the hook, the bird being caught in the snare or trap. You know, the reason a fish gets caught, he couldn't keep his mouth closed. You know why an animal gets caught in a trap? Someone puts some bait in there and it's irresistible. They can't refuse it. So they walk right into the trap and they're caught. They're snared. Satan has many snares out all over the place. And he wants to snare you. He doesn't want you to be set free through the blood of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 9, 12, we're, or 9, 27, or other, we're told that it's pointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. So death is coming. Death is sure. And we're going to meet our appointment with death. Are you prepared to meet your appointment? I said the title of the message would be, Have you made preparation now God made preparation before he ever made the world for your salvation you might say well I didn't know that he did in the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God he coveted with his son that his son would come and be the propitiation for the sins of all men. So God, God knew, and I've been asked this question numbers of times, why if God knew man was going to fall, did he make him subject to fall? I can give you my opinion on that, but don't take it to the bank. God made man as a free moral agent. He didn't, he didn't make us as a bunch of robots. 
Every individual in this building today is a unique individual created by God. And he made you the way you are for a reason. And the reason he made man was to bring honor and glory to himself. But he gave man the choice. We read about it in the book of Deuteronomy. He set before us life and death, blessing and a cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. So what's your answer going to be? Are you prepared? You know, if you're, if you're still in school, whether you're, be, whether you're in home school or whether you're in public or private school, you have assignments to complete. And your teacher, whether it's in a public school classroom or at home with mom as your teacher, they expect those assignments to be completed. If they're not completed, you have to pay the consequences. I remember one time when I was in the second grade, I only got two paddlings in school. One was in the second grade and the other was in the fourth grade. I couldn't keep my mouth shut in the fourth grade and got a paddling. In the second grade, the teacher gave us an assignment to carry an uh, assignment home and get it signed by one of our parents. And I could not remember. And she was kind of, she was long suffering with it. She gave me about three days to get it done. She asked me the first day, and I said, I'm sorry, I forgot. Second day, same story. Sorry, I forgot. She said, You better have it tomorrow. Went back that third day. I forgot it again that night. Well, guess who got paddled the next day? The one that's standing before you. God had an assignment for Jesus Christ. And that was to come to this world and die for your sins and mine. He completed his, his assignment and he ascended back to heaven. And he's coming again one day. We don't know when. No man knows the hour. No man knows the day. But he is going to come back. Are you ready for his appearing? Have you made preparation? It's so important to make preparation. And the thing about it is no one can make that preparation for you. It's not like playing ball, softball or baseball. You can't get someone to run the bases for you. You have to do it yourself. You can't get someone to bat in your place. You have to bat for yourself. No one can be saved for you. You have to come yourself. So have you made that preparation in closing today I think about the day when Jesus died and this being the days of, the day of Jewish preparation for the Sabbath everything was done in a hurry but the important thing is it was done he said well how long would it take me to be saved quicker as quick as you can blink your eye. Just call upon him. No, I'm not going to try to put words in your mouth. But I'll tell you this. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. That's what Scripture tells us. It's a promise of the Lord. 
through his man, the Apostle Paul. We're going to ask for a verse of an invitation hymn. If we sing this song today, the Lord's dealing with you. Allow him to prepare your heart for eternity. If you go to the funeral home and you pre-plan, you're going to have to plunk down some money. But when you allow the Lord to prepare your heart, it won't cost you a thing except your pride. Will you please swallow that pride. Allow the Lord to take control. We stand and sing. Anyway, church, receive memories. You come as we stand and sing. <laughs>